one critical feature of linear time invariant systems that motivates their study is how well they react to pure sinusoidal inputs. If you input a pure sine wave, the output converges on a sine wave with the same frequency, but possibly amplified and phase shifted. One of the coolest applications of this principle happens in neuroscience, in what is called the steady state visually evoked potential, which I learned about from my wife. You see, my wife is a neuroscientist, and we started dating when she was a PhD student at the University of Florida. As so happens in a relationship, before long, she strapped me to a chair, hooked me up to an EEG net and a host of other sensors, and then showed me a whole bunch of flickering images, each at differing frequencies. Then she played a very startling 90 decibel white noise. Her objective was to condition a fear response with the otherwise neutral Gabor patches. Now what happens next is really cool. Your eyeballs connect to the occipital cortex directly in the back of the brain. This means that the flickering images go there first before much of the nonlinear processing that happens to the rest of the brain. If you flicker a bright 10 hertz signal at somebody's eyes, then a corresponding collection of neurons will fire at the same frequency. This firing manifests as electromagnetic potential and is picked up by EEG sensors and fed into a computer for later processing. Now let's think of the visual cortex as a linear system. And while the whole of the cortex is our system state, our output here comes from the EEG sensors. Let's look at just one sensor. If a system is linear and time invariant, we write the output as a convolution of the input with the input pulse response. Let's take a sinusoidal input, which I'm representing here as an exponential for ease of presentation, and we pop that into our convolution. You'll notice that after a couple of manipulations, we can pull out our signal and we are left with this integral. Now, if you look closely, as t goes to infinity, this is simply the Laplace transform of our impulse response function evaluated at the square root of minus one times the frequency of the input. Since this is tending towards a complex constant with respect to time, we can then look at that constant and pull out the complex magnitude and argument from that constant. The argument then hits our original signal causing a phase shift and the magnitude multiplies our original signal, either amplifying up or dampening it down. For each frequency, we get another magnitude and phase shift from our transfer function, where it is evaluated at i times the frequency of the signal. In the EEG data, what you see is a brief transient period corresponding to the onset of the signal. And then a steady state wave. This is the so-called steady state visually evoked potential. What I'm showing here is a simple model, but this is what the data actually looks like. It's kind of noisy here, but if we take an FFT of the data, we can pick out the steady state wave immediately. Something neat that happens is that once the flickering stimulus is conditioned, feedback from the rest of your brain alters your perception and the amplitude changes. You can also tag multiple objects in an image with differing frequencies and can use the relative amplitudes to assess how much a person is attending to each one of the different stimuli. There are so many cool implications of this for neuroscience, and I am very proud of my wife to be in such an exciting field. If you think it's as cool as I do, then why don't you go ahead and boop that like button and show her some love. As a mathematician, there is one thing I take away from this, and that is the visual system can be treated like a linear system in this rather limited setting. Hey, wait a second. Let's go back to that footage. Are you trying to convince your viewers that this is an EEG net? Okay, okay. Yeah, this is a $15 prop I picked up on eBay. I'm no Mr. Beast, so I can't drop thousands on a genuine EEG setup, at least not until I get a whole bunch more subscribers. Now, let's get back to the transfer function. We call the value of the transfer function evaluated at each IW, the frequency response of the system. And so the transfer function's values along the imaginary axis are extremely important here. Now, this isn't the first time we've looked at a transfer function along the imaginary axis, where the Nyquist plot is exactly the contour you obtain by looking at the transfer function there. Typically, we split up the phase shift and amplitude information into two plots. This gives the Bode magnitude plot and the Bode phase plot, and both are presented in a logarithmic scale. These plots are used to analyze the performance of a system and its sensitivity to different inputs, and can be used to design controllers that meet certain specifications. Two things that we would like to design controllers to guard against is the sensitivity to outside disturbances and how sensitive the system is to high frequency noise. Let's look at a block diagram mapping the reference signal to a feedback system with a plant and a controller. If we were to look at the transfer function that takes the reference signal to the output, then we get this. However, 
If we select a different point of entry, say where we have signal noise, then we get this transfer function, this sensitivity transfer function. And the other one is the complementary sensitivity transfer function. Note that they are complementary and that their sum is always one. And that means that you can't get them both to be small at the same time. Now, since we look at the Bode plots on a log scale, we would ideally like the magnitude of the log of the sensitivity function to be negative, since it'd be nice that the response to disturbance is smaller in magnitude than the original disturbance itself. However, there is one critical limitation that was observed by Bode, and this is sometimes called the waterbed effect. That name probably only makes sense to those who were alive during the heyday of waterbeds in the 80s and 90s. Bode, who lived well before the waterbed era, developed what is called the Bode sensitivity integral, which says if you try to integrate the logarithm of the sensitivity function, that the overall integral will equal a constant that is related to how many open loop poles your system has in the right half of the complex plane. This means if you end up making your Bode magnitude plot very small in one area, it will have to blow up in another area to compensate for that smallness. And if it's severely negative in one spot, the function must be severely positive elsewhere. It's sort of like if I take a Ziploc bag of water, since no matter what I do to the bag, it doesn't change how much water is inside. If I squish it in one spot, then it must get larger in other spots. This is where the waterbed term comes from, by the way. From a control design standpoint, the objective is to design a controller that will give the best possible sensitivity function in some respect. I'm going to follow Yamamoto's lead here and simplify to these assumptions. It'll help our discussion, and there's still a lot of value in this setting. Just know that we can extend this idea quite a bit from what we we're saying. Since we know we can't get a nice sensitivity function everywhere, we need to focus on specific ranges. So we're going to consider the performance according to some weight function that emphasizes a particular frequency range. Then we have to decide between a couple of different metrics. For instance, we could try to optimize an L2 signal, like in H2 optimal control. We can, and this is nice, since we can reframe everything as a projection problem. This makes it easy to determine a collection of weights using an inner product. However, we won't get guarantees for a uniform smallness of the result, since L2 norms only really speak to an average over an interval. A better selection, but trickier, is the use of the infinity norm. That is, we want to get control on the absolute value of the size of the sensitivity function and select the controller that optimizes this norm. However, unlike with Hilbert space norms, we aren't gonna get a nice least squares approximation scheme. So I'm gonna give an outline to the resolution of this problem, which will follow Yamamoto and also Doyle Francis Tan Tannebaum's presentation. I put a link in the description if you wanna check out their textbooks. However, most of the mathematical details are gonna be obscured for now. And what we are going to do is develop a shopping list for later videos that will fill in the details. Later, we are going to learn about inner and outer factorizations in Hardy spaces, multiplication operators, and the Neville and Pick interpolation theorem. So subscribe and ding that bell if you want to thread the loop on all these concepts. Now, let's hack away at our optimization problem until we can see how we can resolve it. And again, I should mention that Yamamoto's book is really helpful in describing this process, and I put a link in the description if you want to check out his textbook. We are trying to select a stable controller to get the smallest infinity norm we can out of W times S. The controller C itself manifests through S as 1 over 1 plus P times C. Unfortunately, this is a nonlinear relationship. To get around this, we are going to introduce an auxiliary function Q written like this. And we see that if Q has no poles in the right half plane, then neither does S. Significantly, examining Q, we see that we can trade the nonlinear dependence on C with an affine dependence on Q. Now, most importantly, we see that we can recover C from Q with uh, this relationship here. Here is our new optimization problem, where we still have the same weight, but S has been replaced with in this relation coming from Q. Next, we are going to take the product of our plant with the weight function, which is multiplying Q, and we are going to re-express the quantity as VI times VO, where VI is the inner factor of WP and VO is the outer factor. Outer functions don't have zeros, and we're going to absorb that into our Q term by writing tilde Q is equal to VO times Q. Let's call MS our inner function VI. Now we are going to find 
the tilde q in h infinity such that the norm of this quantity is minimized. This is called the model matching problem. This problem is equivalent to finding the smallest gamma such that this holds for tilde q in h infinity. And we're going to give yet another auxiliary function, g, which corresponds to gamma. Now, if q is a bounded analytic function, then so is g. However, the other way around is not necessarily true because to solve for q, we have to divide by m. But that was our function with the zeros from w times p. That means that we need to make sure that w minus gamma g itself is zero there to make sure that q stays in h infinity. Hence, at each zero si in the right half plane, we must have g of si is equal to one over gamma times w of si. When this happens, all the poles of m inverse are canceled by the zeros of w minus gamma g. Finding a g that satisfies that condition adds an interpolation condition onto the optimization problem and ultimately leads to this. This is the Nevelina pick interpolation problem. And when the video is done, I'll put the video resolving it right here. Until then, check out this video on the Paley-Wiener theorem, which connects L2 signals to the Hardy space through the Laplace transform. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.